Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Ari in the Air. I'm here with one of my favorite mentees, Mr. Ed Conover. And Ed and I had a great flight, some probably like 65, 70K, something like that, here off of Pine Mountain a number of months back. And we have been dissecting it and learning a lot from it. And Ed had some questions about it. So take us away, Ed. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things, uh, I mean, what we've been working on has, I mean, there's been some technical flying um, improvements that we've been working on. Um, but I would say that that's a small percentage of, of what we worked on. The most, the big, vast majority has really been mind space or my headspace mindset. How do we, you know, how do we approach this thing? How do I, uh, improve and achieve the things that I feel that I want to achieve, but do so in a reasonable fashion. And so, um, on the flight you're talking uh, about, and from my perspective, it was a full on, you know, late spring, early summer, um, high desert XC day. Right. It was there were strong climbs and uh, fairly high base and um, and the term turbulence that's associated with that kind of day. And um, when we reached the point, uh, um, we were north of the reservoir and, and kind of due east of Prineville. Um, the and then I'll just back up. One of the other things that I initially came to you with is I, I'd say, hey, listen, I fly really well and then I seem to hit the wall, right? I'm just, I can't climb anymore. I'm just not having it. And uh, so we had talked a lot about eating in flight, drinking in flight, um, breathing techniques, keep the mind, you know, keep the monkey mind under control. And um, I kind of hit the wall at, at, at that point. It was pretty turbulent, and I, but with all of the lift, I was have diff, I was having difficulty climbing. Um, and so I had I, I reached this point basically where I said, okay, this isn't fun anymore. I'm I'm done flying. So I hit you up on the radio. I said, hey, confirm that's Prineville to my west. You're like, yep. I said, all right, good luck to you. I'm gonna tap out here, and. My initial take on that was that was the right call that, it, um, you know, that it was uh, I was not enjoying it anymore. Uh, I had kind of reached the, the limit of uh, what I felt I was able to do. And it was time to be on the ground. And, and to be clear, too, it, it's it, the whole flight. I didn't have any. I didn't have any major events. Um, I was doing a, a, a decent job or a good job, I would say, of keeping the wing open, keeping it flying. My, you know, I was, and up to that point, I was flying pretty efficiently, right? It, I was, you know, you had to wait for me. There's no, there's no doubt about that, but it wasn't forever either. It's like, I got up to you. Um, and uh, so then I spent about an hour working my way west towards Prineville. And the thought of Prineville was, hey, this is going to be easiest for retrieve. It's like, instead of landing way out here in the sticks, let's see how close I can get to Prineville. And as I was moving along, as I always do, I'm like, okay, if I lose lift now, there's my primary LZ. And the next one is that. And I'm so I'm constantly processing that. I didn't need to use any of those LZs because there was lift everywhere, <laughs> right? It was, the day was freaking full on. And I think this was about two-ish in the afternoon like so it was the meat of the day yeah. and so i uh, and even fighting a, a a decent headwind i had no trouble whatsoever making it to prime film it was and probably 15 or 20k from where we split ex exactly so yeah it was a it was a it was a solid hour flight into winds to get there and then it was a solid 15 20 minutes to put it on the ground once I had chosen an LZ. And the reason it took me 15 or 20 minutes is because there was lift everywhere. The day was fully on. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, I put it down safely. Um, everything worked out. 
And it's only recently occurred to me that that maybe that wasn't the safe decision because it was, uh, as you would imagine, a very active LZ. And, and I was very judicious. It was a very large LZ. I had lots of, you know, I've, I had lots of, uh, of room to maneuver and lots of options. I had mm -hmm. purposely chosen it for all of those reasons. But the reality is, is that I was going from two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 feet above the ground to at some point, a hundred feet above the ground in really, really active air. And, um, it, it just, and I guess this was, is my question for you, Ari, is, um, okay, so I'm uncomfortable and I'm kind of feeling like it's, I, I'm just not feeling it. So I'm going to get on the ground. But then I, I think arguably I put myself in more danger by making that choice. Or my question is, did I? And the thing I've been thinking about is maybe on those types of days, because this day wasn't a surprise to me. It wasn't like I looked at the forecast and uh, um, ahead of time and then looked at conditions once I was on launch and thought, oh gosh, I wonder if this will be, no, it was full on, right? And I knew it was going to be full on. And it it almost feels like I need to make a decision before I launch on a day like that in terms of we're going to go. Um, and if we reach a point and we likely will, where it's feeling uncomfortable just to push through that. Um, and because, and then looking at your flight track, you flew on for another hour and a half uh, more, right? And then eventually landed um, because you couldn't get up. You didn't land because you felt like landing. You felt you landed because you were no I longer. blundered it because I blundered yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and there's some backstory to that, too, that involves some ill time text on my part. Um, but still, as I pointed out, like if it had been the same conditions <laughs> as it had been when I decided to tap out two hours prior, OK, you probably could have blundered um and still gotten back up because or maybe not it kind of doesn't matter but my i guess that's my core question is when you're looking at a big xc day where you know it's going to be full on is it safer to push through discomfort at 4000 5000 agl rather than um uh, rather than going and um and trying to land in the heat of the day. Yeah. Okay. Is it safer to push through discomfort when you are in the middle of the day on a big XC day or to force it to the ground? Right? That's the question. Okay. There's a couple things. One thing, and I, I think that we've talked about this a little bit, is, is that a lot of people refer to the risk reward calculation in our heads okay most people are front heavy on that calculation in their heads meaning that they are fixated on the risk changing right changing conditions right and a lot of people aren't super flexible on the second half which is the reward but i would say that if the reward goes to zero then your risk is way out of balance. Right? So if you stop enjoying it, then the risk reward calculation becomes lopsided. Having said that, as you know, things change. Right? Things change. We also tend to get fixated on things. So it's like, you might have said, okay, I'm going to go to Prineville. You start flying that way. You take another climb so that you can make it. And then you actually just got fixated on that I was flying to Prineville to land. And you might have been feeling better by the time you got there. Right? And you might have been fixated and still doing the decision that you made without having reanalyzed, wait, how do I feel now? Should I still be on this course? Or can I turn around and fly into the Ochikos again? So I would say in general, 
the way that I thought about it when I was about at your level was that I was like, stay up, stay up. You don't have to go far. Just stay up in the air. Just stay up in the air. You know, when there's 2000 foot tall dust devils rolling across the high desert, right. you know, I'm like, I don't really want to be down there. So even right. though I don't really want to be here, well, I'm kind of stuck. Um, and in general, since then, I think that, you know, deciding to land, you're always at risk of landing even if you didn't decide to, right? Right. So that's kind of a part of the risk that you've accepted already. Now, forcing right. it to the ground is a slightly different question, right? Like, are you trying to land somewhere that it really doesn't want you to land, AKA it's just like ripping out of there and you're trying to get down through huge lift. That's always a, you know, that's a slightly different thing. But like if you're coring sink and the sink continues to the ground and continues to the ground and you have a safe landing, I mean, I don't understand why that, you know. So tactically, I would say always find sink and try to take it all the way to the ground when it's really active. Because as Bruce Goldsmith says, that if you arrive, if you core sink to the ground, you will land in a lull. And that's one of the reasons why it took me as long as it did, because, you know, it wasn't like I was doing big old wing overs or nose down spiral to try and fight through this. Of course. I was just I was I was being very, very, very patient and waiting specifically for that. That was something I got from Kerry Castle. I didn't know that Bruce had said that as well, but it, it, where it, it's like I'm waiting for this to 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 go, you know, when it's when it's going to allow yeah. me to come down, then I'm going to come down. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, and I do think, uh, um, and you talked to, we have talked about the risk reward ratio and how we can get upside down, um, even if it's only a moderate risk, but we're getting zero enjoyment. Why would you, why take any risk at all? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I, I think that that's, um, that, that, that yeah, I get that. So I, but I think going back to the, the question is, is this almost like, um, once I'm, once you're in the air and, um, it's one thing to, to be trying to make a decision to launch or not, right? It's, it's super easy there because you're out is, yeah, just pack the glider up and walk back to the, to the car and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll run retrieve, right? Once you're committed. And I mean, this is one of those things about paragliding, right? In, in, in its nature is once you've hooked you're committed. There's no, there's no, Hey, let's, you know, let's, let's take a pause. There's no pause. Um, and so, I mean, I, uh, I, I, I somewhat agree, but I also kind of disagree because there is pause, right? Like you take a climb and it's like, even when you're climbing, sometimes you can just like be like, Oh, I'm just going to sit here and just like lay my head on the riser and just like stay on the inside break and just do circles <laughs> here and just like stop trying to like optimize the climb and then you're like okay we're well, at the top of the climb it's going to get light and i'm just going to like just weight shift over and take a piss and drink some water and have a bar and like you know well so you, there, you, there are moments up. there and i also want to say that you're not committed i think that you landed and i flew for another 90 minutes that means that i was in the line of fire for another 90 minutes than you were so it's i i think that you're you're bordering on a cognitive bias or a misconception here. I think that the more time you spend off of the ground, the higher your chance of having an accident is. Right? Like this is just how it is. It This is how it is in avalanche danger. Avalanche danger is not by skill. Avalanche danger is by how much time you spend in avalanche terrain. You know, this is why you see guides die. This is why you see uh, really experienced people who have spent their life in the mountains in avalanche terrain die in avalanches because they're in it all the time. Right. So I do not think you're committed to staying in the sky. I think that there are tactics and there are things that are best practice if you want down. But if I want down, I'm going down, Ed. I'm not thinking about it like midday or not. Like if I want down, I'm going down. I do not second guess whether or not like it's too dangerous down there. Now, having said that, I'm going to use my best tactical approach to try to, to try to get to the ground safely. And the way that I go down as a paraglider is the same way that I go up. 
It's that I find air that's going in the direction that I'm trying to go and I stay in that air, right? So when I'm trying to go up, I find the lift and I turn circles. When I'm trying to go down, I find the air that's going down and I turn circles. The other day, I just flew to Brothers. Just a little like, you know, like a little triangle flight just around, right around Pine. You know, I made it 35K or something. And I had found this huge climb. And then right after it, I just left the climb and I was like, oh, I know the sink is actually close. And so, I, oh, there's some sink and I start coring it. I start coring it. I had almost nine meters a second down. And I was just like casually turning. I was like, wow, this is incredibly productive. And I went from, <laughs> I went from 13,000 feet to the ground in like four or five minutes. And I landed perfectly comfortable and just like, you know, almost nil wind. It was just like, it was ideal. So my point is, I don't think you're ever stuck in the sky as an avalanche. Like if you're in avalanche danger and you're like, I'm not feeling it, get out of avalanche danger. Like that's just, that's full stop. So I don't think that looking back on your flight that you made any wrong decisions or that you like put yourself in more risk. I think getting to the ground sooner puts you in less risk. Just, it's okay. just, that seems to be the case with um, hazardous professions in general, right? So like, and I also just want to validate your intuition, which is like, I'm tired, hungry, over it, overwhelmed. It's over. It's over. Don't like, you will build up the muscle for pushing through as you build up the muscle for pushing through. And you already had used it, right? You had like pushed through something that day. It was like launch was windy and it was like, and then the climb out was like not super easy. And then like how many like times did we like kind of, we zigzagged a lot trying to like stay under the climbs, under the clouds. Cause it was not a super like really crazy booming everything day. There was nice clouds and there was decent climbs where we could find them, but we did a lot of zigzagging and it was um, relatively tedious and not super fast and so we had made 70k but it was like we had earned the 70k that we had made oh yeah that that time we spent over the plateau we, like we were not very high dude and we just no it, those it took little, work those little bullety thermals that i don't know how long we spent there but man that was that that took some time and and, and i appreciate that and, and, and i hold ahead. on let me finish here and then you're you know the the last glide that we took we we climbed up on the far side of the reservoir and then we had this huge glide across a big blue hole that was massive sink that i just pushed full bar and just like the race glider versus the enc two liner was very obvious right and we arrived low onto pilot butte and it was like we're pretty we're not like super deep. There's landings around here, but it's like, okay, we're like, we're out here a ways, you know, it's a very rural highway that we were over, but it's like, there's not cars going up and down it. And the climb was technical and difficult. And so, uh, you know, being spent is being spent and you, you can build it up. You can also like, it's great to have, you know, a lot of the things that we talked about early on in our work together was like knowing how to eat and drink and being able to have the bandwidth to pay attention to your physiology, right? Yeah. And also to use uh, breath work and nervous system regulation in general, just to be able to uh, keep the show on the road. And there are a lot of days, you know, Max and I were talking about this last night. You know, we had done that 24 hour adventure race recently. We did a hundred miles and 17,000 vert and just under 24 hours on bikes and on foot and all of it map and compass navigation through the night and in the rain and it was epic and you're every team member is going to have a moment that they're totally screwed that they don't feel good that they can't eat that they have a stomach ache that they have a headache that their body is really tired that their mind is really tired that their emotions are totally frazzled and In a situation like that, the choice is really obvious to push through because it's going to change. And in paragliding, it's just way more dangerous. It's just way more dangerous to be in the air if you're not totally on it, you know? And I think one thing that you're pointing at is like, if I'm not totally on it, then forcing myself to the ground doesn't sound like a great idea either, right? 
But where we were going, Ed, it was only going to get realer and realer because you split and you flew upwind and I flew downwind in the Ocho Coast and it got really, really strong and super punchy. And I was like, I was scared. I was like, oh man, that is a really sharp one. Um, and it got tall and it got cold and it was different. So, you know, we had two different hazards, but until we're on the ground, the hazard is still very real. So I think that in general, your intuition of I'm done, I want to get to a safe, dry place. It's like, yeah, it's true. And as you build up more and more, you're going to have the moments where you're like, I'm done, but I think this is going to pass. I think I need a piss. I need to drink. I need to eat. I need a reset here. I think I can get a reset because I have this climb. I'm relatively established in this climb. I got lots of AGL. Well, let's take a reset here. Let's have some vision. Let's assess the situation for the next 15 minutes, and then we can make a decision. I think those are all totally reasonable things. But I, what I want to push against is that you made some unsafe decision. I don't think you did. You didn't force yourself down. Find sink, core the sink to the ground. That's all like, that's the best that you can do. Don't try to like find a dust devil and then core it down on top of the dust devil. It's like that it doesn't work anyways. So, um, yeah, pay attention to the risk reward thing. If you stop getting the reward, then what's the risk about? And then once you make that decision of, I want to be on the ground, then there's tactical decisions, how you can do that most safely. Um, but getting out of avalanche terrain is the only way that you're going to take your objective hazard to zero for having a paragliding accident. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want it to sound like I was desperate to get on the ground. I was very patient. Um, yeah. and I mean, it, you had to fly it, a long way to get there anyways. Well, I was ready to land. Uh, you know, it was really a matter of, of, you know, moving towards an objective, but I, I had, I was, you know, you know, I had a plan to land in a, uh, um, probably a half dozen really good locations yeah, on the totally. way there. So, um, and, you know, it's funny you mentioned that big blue hole glide that we did. I, I think that for me, there's definitely a lesson there because, you know, you were pushing full bar and I can't tell if it was that glide or the one before. I could be mixing the two up, but I remember I'm following you. I'm pushing full bar um, and then all of a sudden I'm catching you, which I'm I'm like, OK, this shouldn't be happening. And then I look I look and I realize you're shaking out. You're re you're relaxing. You're chilling. You've gone to trim or close to trim you certainly weren't on, on that much bar because i had to come off bar to, and um so i did I, you know i shook it out i did some breathing but what the opportunity i missed is i didn't eat that would have been that would have been a because it was a long ass glide bro it, it seemed like we were going forever man yeah it was um, probably eight to ten k it was long and i could have easily eaten there because i don't know what you saw but what i felt was almost like a switch to flipped off because it wasn't yeah the, the the thermals were broken over there by pilot peak and and they were they were punchy but that's what we'd had all day right it, this yeah. wasn't anything new yeah. and i had i had puzzled it out but it just seemed like it, my intuition my wing control in terms of of tightening up and and, and opening up was it, it, it was all um, it was all a shambles, and I I think that that honestly was you know had I had a, a nice snack on the way over mm -hmm. that um, probably yeah. would have been feeling it a, a little bit more. But I I very very much appreciate uh, you um, giving me good reason, not just like saying oh yeah yeah you did good, but giving me the right the reasons for for why it was was the right call. It certainly felt like it was the right call at the time, and it wasn't until like a month afterwards that I started doubting it. To be very honest, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, it's interesting because I was there with you, and then you were yes. like staying at my house the day after. So it's like <laughs> right, yeah, so, um, yeah. In general, Ed, I think you are a very conservative and uh, competent pilot whose decision making I super trust. You know, uh, you're long career in a dangerous profession as a police officer has led you to have your head on a swivel and ready to manage those things pretty well. Um, so I really trust your decision making and I hope that I have encouraged you to trust it yourself. Um, another thing I'll say is that 
you know, what something that you're pointing towards is that your blood sugar and your mood are just so linked. Yes. Yeah. So linked. So it's like, am I, and, and your blood sugar and your, uh, reaction time also linked. Right. So if you're hungry, you're bonked, you don't feel good. Like you're not that on. Right. Right. You're not that on. So it is like, uh, it becomes a safety issue as to whether or not you can feed yourself in the air and like manage your physiology in the air. Um, there's also this spectrum that people find themselves on that is like not everyone is as sensitive to their mood right so it's like some people it's like uh, i don't really like this i kind of went out of here for me like man i've flown so far just kind of being over it like i have flown so far being like i'm alone and i'm frozen and i'm hungry and it's just like uh, i'm just like this is also my, it's like, it's at some, at some level, I just think about December and I'm like, there's not going to be a thermal in December, bud. You're going to wish that, that you had, it's like, it's my penance. I'm like, I have just committed myself to being a paraglide pilot. And this is my penance. I'm a central Oregon paraglide pilot. We got a short season. Get to it, bud. You got to retrieve on the ground. Don't blow it today. You got to retrieve on the ground. Yeah. You know? And, you know, the day that we're talking about, Ed, I, I landed in a windy ass canyon on a dirt road with trees on both sides. So okay. it's not like, you know, like you had a really nice landing. The wind was relatively laminar where I landed. And then, you know, half an hour later, the big F-350 driven by a 10 year old child. And then we found a rattlesnake. <laughs> and it ended up being an incredible day. I loved it. But, right. um, but uh, you know, I, my flight wasn't like safe because I continued. No, no, no. My flight was like, I was flying over Ochoco pass. I was over completely forested terrain, really high altitude. And then it was like, I was scratching out of Mitchell and it was like, no, it was not like I was not safe because I continued and you were dangerous. No, no, no. You made the conservative decision, had a big open landing field, all these things. Yeah. And really nice shade to pack in and grass. Um, you, you know, and, and it's interesting that you say something because I, I uh, or you talked about that. I, I do want, like we talked about a lot of the factors that might have gone into my decision making. You know, maybe I was a little hypoglucemic. Um, you know, I had, you know, for you, it wasn't a long flight, but, you know, I was a solid three ish hours. Three and a half or something. Thing, three and a half. Like yeah. we've been, we've been flying. Um, so we, we're reaching, you know, we're getting close to what my current, my current, ceiling is but i i can't help but wonder because it, it wasn't lost on me when i was climbing above pilot and looking down course line and those were very different clouds bro and that was very different terrain because all all around um you, you know the reservoir you know all around pine around the reservoir it's it's like where's your lz well it's there it's there it's there it's there it's yeah it's there, everywhere it's, it's there. anywhere yeah, everywhere it's, it's sage like it buddy be, it's sage it might be rem it might be remote you might yeah. be looking at a five six hour hike but it's like you're not you're not at a loss for landing places yeah. and then north of pilot peak um the terrain was very different and there were and i can't help but wonder if i was there wasn't a part of me subconsciously looking at that line you're like uh -uh. and i'm thinking you're like i know what Aries doing <laughs> <laughs> so um so i think it's kind of like when you go skiing with people the first thing you tell them is don't follow me um I do. right <laughs> yeah, I, do, so, I do right it, so it, there, there could have been that as as well but i i do want to say man that was um all told, that was a really exceptional flight for me. I, I really, um, I, I enjoyed the absolute bejesus out of it. It was very, uh, very, very enjoyable and and um, super chuffed with what, um, you know, what I was able to, to, you know, kind of breaking some mental barriers because that was probably the first flight that I'd ever spent where I was on not just bar, but full bar, the it, it, essentially the entire time i wasn't climbing so um and, and the whole uh, time i'm like ed more bar man <laughs> what's going on back there 
<laughs> no, I, my glider was a bit out of trim on that flight. It was really fast. It's been, I've slowed it down since then. It's working better now. Okay. Okay. But, but regardless, I do want to, I, I do want to thank you, um, you, you know, for that, for that flight and, and also to all the, um, you know, we've been, we've been doing this work together for about three months now. And, uh, it, uh, like we've been talking for a year, um, ish. And, but it was really in the last three months where we're like, okay, let's actually do this thing. And, uh, it's, uh, it's been fantastic, brother. I, I appreciate the heck out of it, man. Yeah, thanks so much, Ed. And it's been wonderful working with you. And I just super appreciate how you show up in our community. And you're a integrated and uh, loving man who has great relationships with other men and a an gleaning uh, reputation in the community. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Okay, love you, buddy. Love you too, bud. See you later. All right, man. Have a good one. All right. Later.